Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dan Kaysen from UC Berkeley. Um, Dan is a jack of all trades. He works on uh, many aspects of microphysics and transport, and also issues in astronomy, optical and x-ray, and uh, also issues in the dynamics of compact optic mergers, and uh, such as observables as light curves, for example. So. Um, uh, and he's going to tell us about a number of issues. Um, I think we made up this title on the fly without <laughs> actually uh, running it by you, but you've apparently kept it. So, No, it's perfect. Okay. Hopefully it's perfect. We'll see. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I, I'm going to, I think you've heard a little bit about radiation transport <clears throat> already in the talks about core collapse supernova. Uh, and of course the talk we just heard before. Uh, about flavor oscillations. I'm going to, in a sense, take a step back from that talk and simplify things back from all this uh, interesting and complex uh, oscillation physics and just talk about uh, just the moving around of energy and momentum by radiation uh, and try to convince you that that's a super hard problem as well. And in fact, it's sort of a, a um, defining problem in computational astrophysics that, uh, you know, all fields of computational astrophysics in star formation, galaxy formation, Planet formation, we have hydrodynamics, but we also have radiation that's moving around and playing a big role in those dynamics. And that's definitely the case in core collapse supernovas, I'm sure you heard, uh, where you have a collapsed uh, iron core that forms a proto-neutron star. And it's the neutrinos, we think, that carry the energy from that core out to some larger radius to actually explode the star. And that's really the challenge that people have been trying to do and still haven't done in, a, in its fullness. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do is, is, you know, we just have an hour or so, so I'm just going to try to give a broad overview of what the problem is, why it's hard, uh, and how um, people can go about trying to solve it, usually through approximate methods. Um, I'm obviously not going to teach you how to write a, a complicated radio transfer code, but uh, my hope is that you can read papers in the literature or see talks where people talk about quirk lap simulations and other simulations and have a sense of, of how they're treating this problem and, and what the limitations are. Okay, so let me kind of motivate it first. Why do we do this radiation transport? Okay, the first is kind of obvious. It's what we see is radiation. That's how we know everything we basically know about supernova. We see photons a lot. Occasionally we see neutrinos uh, emitted from these things. We see their light curves and spectra, and those carry a lot of information. Uh, uh, I guess in a sense we also see particles, you know, protons and nuclei from these supernovas, these cosmic rays bombarding us. But uh, those carry a lot less information about what actually happened in the supernova and the, the physics and the nucleosynthesis. So this is where, where most of our information is. And if we want to test our theories and test uh, our simulations, we want to simulate the photons and neutrinos and, and actually compare the data. Um, and then what I just said, radiation is dynamically important. Uh, it, it transports energy and momentum around. Uh, in the core collapse case, it's the neutrinos we think that are are uh, crucial in the explosion, um, but in all sorts of astrophysics you have photons pushing on stuff and moving stuff around, heating and cooling gas. And then also, as Young said, radiation can change the composition of material. The weak interactions can change protons uh, into neutrons by absorption of a neutrino or, or uh, antineutrino. And so this has a big effect if we want to calculate the nucleosynthesis from, from things. So those are all good reasons why we need to include radiation transport in our uh, calculations. This is, you probably saw some simulations from Christian and Tony. Uh, this is another sort of simulation using the Castro code of a core collapse supernova, where you see the core of a massive star collapse, and then a proto-neutron star starts to form. There's a bounce, and then this shock starts to move out, right? And this shock is being powered by neutrinos that are you know, transporting energy. You can't see the neutrinos here. Obviously, this is just the density plot of, of what's going on in the, in the simulation. Uh, and actually, this, the neutrino transport here was highly simplified. It's just a kind of leakage scheme, which I'll explain. Um, and so here you see something that explodes, and there's going to be some nucleosynthesis here. But all this dynamics and nucleosynthesis depends uh, very strongly on how you treat the neutrinos, which, as I said, in these simulations so far, uh, is not so great, even though the hydrodynamics is really amazing. So that's sort of cutting edge of what we uh, want to do. And then I say we see this stuff, so we see neutrinos from supernova, or we saw it from one supernova, 87A. I don't, I, I don't know exactly which 
uh, data this is, but you can kind of see it was sort of noise, and all of a sudden, boom, for a few seconds, got a bunch of neutrinos coming out, and then nothing. And so a handful of neutrinos from 87A uh, carry some information as to the explosion. More often, you know, it's, uh, we see the photons from, from uh, supernova. This is a little example. You look in a galaxy and you see some uh, stars start to brighten and fade. And this happens over a much longer time scale. The neutrinos came out over seconds. These photons are coming out over weeks. So this light curve here gets brighter over a period of, uh, in this case, a couple weeks, and then fades away. And the emission is mostly in the, the optical. And of course, the longer time scale here is naturally associated with the fact that the photons are much uh, more strongly interacting particles. So they're trapped a lot longer than the neutrinos. They can't get out for, for many weeks or months. And so we're now the surveys are finding light curves like this in spectra for supernova multiple times a day. Uh, so there's, there's thousands of supernova being observed. There's a lot of information in here, all these wiggles about the nucleosynthesis and the energetics of that explosion. And here's kind of just a, a, a schematic of what's going on and where different transport processes are important in a supernova. Uh, I plotted here on this scale sort of the radius to see where things are happening. So neutron star down here at you know, 10 to the 6 centimeters or 10 kilometers, the iron core at about the radius of the Earth, and the edge of the star, if it's a red giant, may be out at uh, something the size of the Earth-Sun distance, right? And here's time on this axis. So the collapse of the star is very fast. It just lasts for milliseconds. And then all of a sudden, you form a neutron star, and it bounces. So there's some gravitational wave emission. That's another kind of radiation I won't talk about because it's very simple in some sense. Gravity is an even weaker force right, than, than the rest. So uh, there's really no interaction. That stuff just is uh, its optically thin to gravitational wave. That stuff just goes away. Um, but the, the core collapses and bounces, and a shock starts its way out. The neutrinos are initially trapped, but after some period of time, they can break out, and you get a burst of neutrinos. And then we hear, see the issue that the shock starts to stall. But the neutron star is still accreting and radiating neutrinos, which eventually revive it, we think, and produce a, a shock that runs all the way out of its star. So the neutrinos are happening really here, very small scales down around neutron star radius, lasting for seconds. We don't see any photons, because this is all very optically thick to photons until this shock kind of reaches the surface of the star. Then you might see a burst of light, UV light, as the photons come out. And then we see that light curve I just showed in the movie uh, at even longer times of weeks and months and happening at much larger radii. So, that, so we're kind of probing much different uh, physical scales and time scales here with the photons and neutrinos. So uh, well, let me just kind of explain what I mean when I'm talking about radiation. Why, why did I single out the photons and neutrinos? I mean, everything going on in here is just particles that are bouncing around and interacting with each other in various ways. So why do we need transport for photons and neutrinos? The, the answer, of course, is just that the interaction cross-sections are, are generally lower for these kind of particles than for other ones. So for example, photons can interact with gas in a lot of ways that I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but one typical one is electron scattering, where the cross-section is the Thomson cross-section about 10 to the minus 24 uh, centimeters squared. Um, a neutrino, typical cross-section from bouncing off, say, a nucleon, is on the uh, Fermi coupling constant and the energy squared. And of course, that's much lower, 20 orders of magnitude lower cross-section than typical photon cross-section. So that's why those neutrinos can escape from the dense center regions, whereas the photons are trapped. And then the particles that form the gas, the charged particles like electrons and protons, they can, you know, Coulomb scatter off each other, and their cross sections are something like the Thomson cross section times the uh, uh, energy to the minus two. And depending on their energies, you know, for kind of lower energy stuff, those cross sections can be much higher than uh, than for photons. And so the gas is basically trapped; uh, it collides with itself and, and diffuses out. So photons and neutrinos are the ones that can move around more, uh, more easily. And so when do we need to treat the, the transport? Well, it's a question of, of time scales. You know, are photons and neutrinos moving around energy and momentum 
on a time scale that's um, short or, or comparable to the time scale that you're trying to do a simulation or watch something happening, so you're hydrodynamical time scale, and so you can look at, well, it depends on the optical depth that you have to these particles, which is really just a function of the cross-section times the density of scatters or absorbers and the radius here. So if you're optically thin and the particles can just free stream, that time scale is just the length scale over the speed at which these particles move, and we'll always take that to be the speed of light. If it's optically thick, then particles have to diffuse out, you know, kind of a random walk forward and back, and it turns out the diffusion time is just that free streaming time times the optical depth. Okay, so if these time scales are, are you know, things are happening on the dynamical time scale, you want to start doing some transport. You can kind of see this in the core collapse case. So if you talk about neutrinos around a neutron star, you know, you have optical depths of several and the time scale for them to move around is milliseconds. So you definitely want to include neutrino transport when you're trying to model the core collapse of a, of a massive star. Um, the time scale for photons to diff, you know, diffuse out of a solar type star, well the optical depths are much higher because the cross sections are higher as I showed you. And the time scale is much longer, 10,000 years. So you might have heard that number that a photon generated in the sun wanders around, scatters around for 10,000 years before uh, it, it finally escapes to, to come to us. And so for the, on the time scale of the core collapse explosion, you don't have to worry about photons moving things around at all. They're just trapped with the fluid. They basically behave like a fluid. But you do have to do the neutrinos. Uh, and then, of course, at later times, once the star has exploded and it's expanded as a supernova remnant for some weeks, then the optical depth of photons goes down and, and the time scale for them to diffuse out it becomes comparable. So you need to do neutrinos when you solve for the explosion, uh, photons for the aftermath. If I go back to, let's see, this plot, then this is what I'm saying here, that here the neutrinos can start to transport around on these time scales, but photons are trapped. But out here um, is when the uh, photons start to escape, and that's when we start to see that light curve. Okay. So, like I said, my, my goal is to just let you uh, have some broad view of, of what's involved in, in dealing with this transport problem and how people deal with it. And I guess the first thing to say is how do we uh, describe radiation? Uh, I mean, in a particle point of view, you think of, say, photons as a bunch of particles moving around in all different sorts of directions, but we don't want to keep track of every individual photon. Uh, so basically what we rely on is what you call a distribution function, which may be familiar from statistical mechanics. You say for some box, some little parcel of gas here uh, at some position x, y, z and some time t, you can basically count up all the photons moving in some direction defined by the spherical angles theta and phi, right? And you can count up all the particles that are, have a specific energy, uh, e, or equivalently a frequency nu. So you can basically count all the photons in different bins moving in different directions uh, and different, uh, with different energies. So this is kind of a complicated function, right? It's a function of seven variables. It's a seven-dimensional sort of function that we're dealing with here. If you rather, this is a you know, function of uh, a phase space of three spatial coordinates and three momentum coordinates describing the motion of the particle and, and time. So, so that's what we're dealing with. Uh, when we do radiation transfer, we usually use a quantity called the specific intensity, which is uh, basically the same thing as this distribution function. You just change the units. You multiply it by an energy, h nu, and by the speed of light. And that turns this, gives it units of intensity, kind of a flow of energy, an energy crossing an area uh, per unit time. Um, but whatever you have, you have here some complicated function. It's a function of seven variables. We have a kind of a seven-dimensional problem. You kind of think of specific intensity or this is, is sort of a, a laser beam like this, right? This is a collimated beam, has a specific direction and a specific frequency to it, right? And if I was to describe the radiation field in some location, I'd have to describe all the laser beams in all directions with all different frequencies. So there's a lot of information at each point to describe. Now I'll mention equilibrium because that's the case that we're kind of familiar with from hydro and other things. Uh, if we have some 
material where collisions are frequent so that the uh, particles can exchange energy and momentum, then the distribution starts to become isotropic. That is, we don't care about, uh, well, it's the same in all directions. There's no theta and phi dependence. Um, and the E dependence is, is a known function. So, you know, your classical case of your classical gas, uh, uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, um, the, the particles are isotropic and their, their energy, kinetic energy or velocity is a known function. It depends only on temperature, right? So we have a simple description uh, of what's going on. And so that's what happens sort of in, in hydrodynamics and gas since the, you know, the cross sections are, are usually higher and there's more interactions. We can sort of make this assumption that we don't need to know the theta and phi dependence. Uh, we don't need to know the, the, the full E dependence because it just depends on T. And we just kind of solve for the density and temperature uh, of the gas. Um, but radiation will generally not be in, in equilibrium, so we can't see that. Um, so you can kind of see that in this room, right? The parcel of gas here, the molecules are colliding. They're in basically an equilibrium where they, you know, all the particles are isotropic. There's no preferred direction. And they'll have this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. But the radiation in this field is not isotropic at all, right? If you turn around and look behind you, you won't see my screen anymore. You won't see me. You have to face this way to see what's going on. And you have to, uh, you can see here the spectrum is there's red and blue and green and all sorts of different things. So the radiation is, I mean, that, that's what makes life interesting or your visual life interesting is that the radiation is not in equilibrium because the cross sections are low and stuff can, can stream around. Uh, and that's what makes radiation transport interesting and important uh, in, in astrophysics. And uh, it's also what makes it hard because we have to deal with this function now that's a, a function of, of uh, seven variables. So that's how we describe the radiation. Now we need an equation that will let us calculate what it is for some problem of interest. And that's basically the radiation transfer equation, which is the same thing essentially as the Boltzmann equation or collisionless Boltzmann equation, just describing how this intensity or this distribution function changes in time and space. So it's kind of an intuitive equation, right? That there's a change in time here of the intensity that's related to how intensity flows around in space and there, how it's uh, absorbed by the matter. So chi here is a quantity that describes how the matter absorbs radiation or scatters it. It depends on the cross section and the density. There's a source here of emission the matter efficient emission coefficient, which will depend on the temperature and properties of the gas. And then there may be scattering as well, where light from a certain direction will be scattered in another direction, and that sort of couples together the intensity moving in different directions. So we have sort of an integral here over theta and phi. So kind of pictorially to understand what this equation is, it's kind of intuitive. You have a intensity coming into some region here, right? And some things can happen in here. It can be, the radius can be uh, attenuated by absorption. That's this term. It could be attenuated by light being scattered off into a different direction. That's this term. Or it's actually included this term. Uh, or it can be increased by uh, emission here, that term, or by light from another direction scattering into the beam. So that's all this equation is saying. Basically, it's, it's just a way of kind of counting up the particles that are moving in a specific direction in a specific energy and how they get changed is uh, by various sorts of interactions. Okay. And kind of what makes it hard is that these uh, extinction coefficients and emission coefficients, which look simple here because I just pick a Greek letter to describe them, are actually quite complicated and will depend upon what the radiation itself is doing, right? Because the radiation will heat the gas, it may ionize it, it may scatter. And so um, you have sort of a chicken and egg problem that in order to solve this equation for the specific intensity, you need to know the chi and the eta. But you usually don't know chi and eta until you know what the radiation field is doing, because that's partially setting that. So you have to sort of use an iterative thing um, to try to solve this all self-consistently how the matter and radiation are uh, exchanging information and such. 
So it's a hard problem. That's one thing I want to get across. It's a 7D problem, right? So I mean, you can just imagine trying to do a simulation. You break up your space into this 3D Cartesian grid. And then you look in one of these cells, and there's even more information. Inside this one cell, I have to describe the radiation intensity along all these different directions, in theta, in phi, and also in different energies, right? So that's a lot of information. Even in one cell, we have a whole uh, spectrum and a whole directionality to the radiation field to keep track of. So for example, if you wanted to discretize this problem, and let's say we use a 3D grid that's 256 cubed. Um, it's not even that big for these days simulations. And let's say we break up angles into different bins of, say, 30 theta, 35 bins, and 30 different frequency bins. Um, so that's something like several times 10 to the 11 points that we have to store. The memory associated with that is about a terabyte. So that's a, that's a lot of information to store. And then to update this and solve the equation a lot for all these points is obviously very computationally expensive. So to do this problem you know, fully and with this sort of resolution, you know, it's sort of looking towards the, the exascale type machines that we might have in you know, five, 10 years. So this might be sort of your defining kind of problems of, of you know, using a really big machine to solve this problem fully. Uh, I mean, since it's so hard and since it's, it's hard to do um, completely, people still want to do some sort of transport in their um, simulation, say, of a core collapse supernova. So there's all these different schemes that people use that are basically approximations to that full problem. Uh, and I listed some of them here that you'll often he hear people talk about in talks or you'll read about in, in some core collapse paper. And I want to hopefully have a sense that by the end you can kind of understand when people say they used an M1 method or a leakage that you have a sense of, of what they did and what the approximations they, they made are. Okay, So I'll kind of go through some of those different approximate methods um, and then show you some... Uh, calculations. So I mean the most approximate thing is to kind of not do transport at all. Uh, that's, a, that's an easy way to get around the problem. Uh, and, and people uh, do this. You know, the easiest thing is to just say, well, let's say everything's optically thin so that the radiation field, I don't actually have to worry about all these scattering or absorption in terms. I just say, you know, there's some emission here, eta, and all of that just goes away and cools off. It doesn't get reabsorbed anywhere. And if there's some spherical source, so say a light bulb uh, at the center, which represents my neutron star radiating out uh, spherically, then at some radius r, the flux there, it just falls off like 1 over r squared. I don't worry about the absorption and scattering that happens between the source and, and where I am. Okay, And that's kind of what, um, you know, in these, these complicated multi-angle uh, flavor oscillation you know, calculations that we've seen, people are kind of doing this optically thin assumption because it's a very difficult kind of problem to do with any, you know, full transport. Uh, a step above that, which has been used a lot, especially in these 3D core collapse simulations, is what generally called leakage schemes. That's saying, well, you know what, it, 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 this material is not really optically thin. There is some optical depth that's greater than one. So let me just put in some sort of attenuation. So if I want to say, for example, how much does a zone cool, it's not just the emission coefficient, I'll suppress it by e to the minus tau, where tau is some optical depth, you know, some appropriate average optical depth, you know, along all, say, de directions that the radiation can escape, okay? And if I want to know, you know, what the, optic, what the radiation field is from, say, my source, my spherical neutron star source, I'll not just take 1 over r squared, I'll attenuate it by some optical depth, e to the minus tau. And so there's various ways to kind of do this with more or less sophisticated ways. You can imagine in 3D, the optical depth is different along different directions. So maybe you integrate optical depths along all different directions and take some sort of average optical depth, or maybe you do something more clever. But basically, the idea is just to have attenuation factors uh, in the radiation field. And so it captures some of the key uh, optical depth effects, but it's not really doing the real transport. It's not solving this problem of how the, the neutrinos actually move around. 
the other transport methods are basically trying to simplify things by reducing the dimensionality of this 7D problem. So, um, you know, if you can cut down a few dimensions, you're, you're in much better shape. You can try to cut them down in various places. So you can cut down spatial dimensions, do a, say, a 1D spherically symmetric calculation. Okay, that, that saves you a couple dimensions. Or 2D axiosymmetric. Um, often people are doing these ray by ray methods, which is you might have a 3D calculation, but you only solve the transport equation along a ray. So you take sort of a, a radial ray and solve it along that ray, and then solve the uh, same 1D transport problem against all different rays. So you're solving a 1D transport problem many times um, in a 3D calculation, but the different transport solutions don't talk to each other. So there's not, there's not sort of angular crosstalk. So it's a way of mapping a 1D solution onto a, a 3D model, basically assuming that each radial ray is uh, mapped into a spherically symmetric calculation. So that's commonly done uh, in some of these 3D calculations. Uh, you, can, you can neglect frequency dependence, just sort of integrate out the frequency um, and do what's called gray transport, since you have sort of no color information. Um, uh, to do it properly, though, you want to have what's usually called multi-group or multi-frequency calculation or multi-energy. You want to solve it, uh, let the neutrinos uh, keep track of their frequency dependence. And then also you can try to simplify things by simplifying this angular part. So the diffusion, approxim diffusion approximation, moment methods, and so on. Try to simplify the angular information, and I'll explain that in a bit. The proper way to do it is often called Boltzmann transport. You're, you're not approximating away the, the angular dependence of the radiation field. So I'll kind of go through some of these, give you a sense of what's involved in them. The first one uh, approximation I mentioned is, is just sort of the gray approximation. You take your radiative transfer equation and you just integrate it over all frequencies and you get something now simpler. I don't have to solve it at all different frequencies of the spectrum. Uh, I just have one equation that describes um, the whole spectrum, and I take some sort of average extinction coefficient now that's averaged over some, say, Planck function or something. So this is not really great for supernova neutrinos since uh, a lot of the cross-sections that are important depend sensitively on the energy or, or the frequency of the neutrinos. Like I said, the cross-sections depend upon the energy squared, so if you kind of integrate out all that information and just solve it as a gray problem, you lose out some of the key physics that's, um, that's going on here um, of how neutrinos interact with matter. So you really want to keep uh, the, the spectrum information, the frequency information in your simulation. And so most people wouldn't make this uh, approximation for a neutrino problem in a core collapse supernova. Um, the other methods usually involve kind of simplifying the angular dependence um, by kind of, uh, in a sense, decomposing the problem of this complicated function of, of angle into some sort of moment. So you can kind of think of it as like a, a expansion in spherical harmonics, right? If you had some complicated function of angle, you could always decompose it into spherical harmonics. There'd be one sort of, uh, you know, monopole term, and then there'd be some dipole terms and higher order and higher order terms. and if you know, these would describe uh, more and more detailed angular information. And if maybe you can just sort of decompose it into a few of these, you're approximating it because you're losing all this high order information, but essentially uh, you're making your problem a lot easier because you're dealing with a much uh, lower dimensional kind of situation. So that's not using spherical harmonics necessarily, but basically the same idea people do is to try to take this equation, which again uh, depends upon the angle at which uh, the radiation is moving, and just integrate out the angle dependence. So you take the radiative transfer equation and you integrate it over all angles, so over theta and phi, and you get what's called the zeroth moment. And uh, if you look at that equation, uh, you can write it in terms of an integral of the intensity, which is related to the basically the radiation energy density and uh, integration over kind of the first moment, which is the flux. So these would kind of correspond to the, this would be sort of the energy term and this would kind of be the flux term, right? The first uh, 
kind of expansion terms, and then the equation becomes a little simpler. It, actually, it looks a lot like an energy equation, right? It's basically expressing radiation energy equation, that the change in radiation energy is related to escaping flux, the absorbed energy, and the emitted energy. So we've reduced that radiation transport equation, which was a function of theta and phi, to something that no longer has a theta and phi dependence. But you'll see that it's not a closed system. We have one equation here, and we actually have four variables. We have the energy, and we have three. We have a flux vector. And so it's not a closed system of equations that you can solve. So you go ahead and say, OK, I'll take the first moment of the radiation transport equation. I'll integrate it over all angles, but weighted by this direction vector. And you get another equation here that associated with the flux and also now a pressure tensor. That's, again, the, the next higher order moment of the radiation field. Uh, and this is a, uh, now an expression of radiation momentum conservation. So we got three new equations by doing this moment, but we've added more unknowns in the pressure tensor now. And you can keep going, taking higher and higher moments. So you know, you look at this, you can keep going with higher and higher sort of expansions. But the equations here are always going to depend upon the next higher order terms. And so that's sort of the issue that we can't close the system um, unless we make some approximation. And so the common one is the diffusion approximation. You use only the zeroth moment where you've integrated out all the angle information. And then you say the flux is just a simple function of energy, right? And so this closes the system because now you know the flux is just a, a say, a gradient of the energy density. And now between these two equations, I have you know, four equations and four unknowns that can be solved. Right, so this is just kind of a simple way of describing the radiation. It kind of flows, you know, down the energy gradient. It flows from regions of high uh, radiation energy density. The radiation will flow to regions of low density, just like an odor will diffuse through a room. Right, so it just it kind of diffuses out with some diffusion coefficient. Right, and so this is what a lot of the calculations are doing. Basically, they're a very simple expression for the for the angular dependence of the radiation field. Uh, how do you solve it? I won't go into the details here, but I just kind of give you the big picture. Uh, you know, you're, you're basically trying to solve some sort of parabolic differential equation. Um, and, you know, you do your standard thing where you can discretize these derivatives. So you take, you know, this is u, the energy density of radiation at point i between time step n plus 1 and n over the time step. That gives you sort of a derivative. And then you can discretize these second spatial derivatives. Uh, and you'll see that the kind of updated temperature only depends upon the energy density in zone i, i plus 1 and i minus 1. So you basically get, for all spatial points, you get kind of a, a matrix, a tridiagonal matrix. So here's all the radiation field. Uh, I used E on the previous slide, but here this described, it's using the notation U. Um, and to get the U, you basically have an operator which looks like a tridiagonal matrix. The details get kind of complex, but the main thing to kind of take away is that this diffusion equation maps onto basically a linear set of equations. So you want to use some uh, linear solver. People use conjugate, conjugate gradient or multigrid methods. Now this is really kind of where the rubber meets the road in the, in the diffusion solutions. And in a lot of transport, you wind up with some linear set of equations, and you need some sort of linear package, right, to solve those equations. Um, and there's, so there's a huge amount of literature on, on how to do this and how to do this efficiently. But the takeaway is just that uh, this is kind of what your problem looks like. You often people, you, you read people saying their codes uses uh, flux limited diffusion. That's a sort of just a fix up to the diffusion approximation. So. Um, the diffusion approximation has a problem that the flux be can become infinitely large when the material is optically thin. So if this chi goes close to zero, the flux will get larger and larger and could even become uh, so high that it effectively it's uh, transporting energy at faster than the speed of light. So what people do is they 
fix it up by some fudge factor. They throw in some fudge factor here called D. Uh, and they make up some function that kind of has the right behavior. So here's the kind of popular function people make up. It's a function of this ratio of the gradient of energy density over energy. And it's just a made up function, but the reason it's chosen the way it is is that it gives you the right limits if you actually take the limits here. Now if chi goes to zero, instead of this kind of blowing up, uh, this term here also goes to zero, goes close to zero and the, the flux goes to just C times the energy density. So you have basically free streaming light, energy moving at the speed of light. Uh, and in the optically thick limit, this goes to the standard diffusion approximation, okay? So it kind of gets things right in these two limits, but it's sort of the in-between area where it's just a fudged factor in there to mix it up. And, uh, uh, and actually that in-between area is usually the interesting area, right? It's where things are kind of not so optically thick, but they're not so optically thin. So it's one of the limitations. And one of the big limitations, of course, is that the diffusion approximation, it's not really capturing the full angular information of the radiation field, right? That's what that's how we came about it. We, we took averages over theta and phi, so we're not really uh, keeping the full angular dependence. And you can kind of see that dramatically in this kind of shadow problem. So if I put a spherical kind of opaque object here and emit light kind of in this direction, what you expect to see is, is basically a shadow behind this obstruction here. But in the diffusion approximation, the radiation just sort of oozes around the uh, <laughs> obstruction, right? Just uh, goes, moves around. I mean, it's just diffusing out, like, a, like an odor diffuses through a room. If you shine a light, uh, la a flashlight in the diffusion approximation, it'll go down the hall, turn the corner, go all around, seep into every room, right? And so uh, that's not, uh, and, th and that's just because we haven't kept track of the real angular dependence of the radiation field. We've, we've averaged it out. And so, um, that's obviously bad if you have some 3D problem and you maybe have obstructions like this or you have clumps of material. Um, you're not really capturing the radiation quite well. So what's the, this other method I show here is called M1. It does a much better job at getting the shadow right. What is that? It's very similar to flux limited diffusion and so this is sort of a souped up flux limited diffusion that's becoming more and more popular in simulations. You, use the same zeroth order moment, but you also add in the first order moment. And you need now a closure relationship that relates this pressure tensor to flux. So just like with flux limited diffusion, we use some equation that related F with E. Here we go one order higher, and then we use some made up analytic relation that relates P to F. So it's the same kind of idea. We have some kind of mock-up thing here to, to close the system but we're kind of going one step higher uh, in our expansion in, in angle. And as you can see, that does um, quite a bit better, say, in this shadow test. Um, you know, not perfectly. There's some smearing here, but it does a much better job than diffusion because you have now more angular information in your, in your radiation field. It has its limitations, too. I mean, you can kind of see it in this test problem, I took this actually from Jim Stone's lecture from the high pack summer school last year, so these things are uh, available. He gave a nice lecture on radiation transport that you can uh, download and watch on the web. Uh, but here's a case of kind of two spherical emitting sources, and flux limited diffusion now kind of gives you what you'd expect. But in M1, you can actually have a colliding radiation fronts produce almost like a shock region because again, you're not really capturing the full angular dependence of the radiation field. Um, you're doing some, some average. So all, approxim all approximate methods have their limitations. What would one would like to do is do, you know, full Boltzmann transport, don't make any approximations. Um, and that's been done for certain uh, limited uh, applications, so you know, you have again this radiative transfer equation, and now you just want to really integrate it up, you want to do your radiation field. Uh, for every point in space, you have to integrate out many different directions, right, and theta and phi. Um, people sometimes use long characteristics methods, which mean you kind of integrate these rays all the way through your domain. 
Uh, more popular now is sort of short characteristics where you just integrate sort of cell to cell. And to get array, you kind of interpolate between these uh, integrations. But basically, the idea is, is to, to carry along the full uh, angular information of the radiation field and, and integrate this equation. Again, as I mentioned earlier, to, to solve this, you need to know um, what eta is and what chi is and what the radiation field is already doing because, you know, a photon from here could come here, scatter out, and scatter into this beam here. So you have to kind of know the solution before you solve it, and so you have to use some sort of iterative technique to, to do this. But there's various techniques, accelerated lambda iteration and so on, if you want to look up uh, techniques for solving this. This has been done in 3D, but not in the context of a hydrodynamical simulation. So for example, snapshots, you know, steady state kind of things, or, or sort of post-processing of hydrodynamics. No one's incorporated this into a full um, hydrodynamics code that I know about. Variable Edding Eddington tensor is uh, another approach to do the full transport. So again, as before, you, s you keep these two moment equations, but instead of using a fake closure relation, you actually use the real one by solving the full Boltzmann equation, as I just described. And the advantage of doing this is that you don't have to solve, the, you know, do this full solution for all different directions. Uh, at every time step, you can do it once in a while, uh, you know, every hundred time steps or something. Uh, and, and just to kind of update this, since this closure may not be changing as, as quickly as your transport is. And so then it's not as, uh, uh, as uh, computationally expensive. This has been uh, implemented in the Athena code um, to the MHD code that Jim Stone and others have used. And then Monte Carlo methods is the last. It's, it's for a very intuitive kind of method. It's you don't you kind of dispense with all these uh, uh, specific intensities and so on and just describe the radiation field by particles uh, and you follow them individually as they move through some medium and they may scatter or absorb or, or move around. And, uh, and you kind of sample their propagation and their interactions by choosing random numbers uh, and sampling from some probability distribution. So it's kind of very intuitive because you can just sort of follow the way nature does things. Of course, um, you can't create as many photons on the computer as nature would make in a in the supernova or as many neutrinos. Um, so you just have to sort of sample each, each uh, one of those little particles I just showed you was actually a packet that might represent 10 to the 40 photons. Uh, and you give them some position vector and some direction vector, a frequency, and a total energy. And then you sort of watch them as they diffuse their way out. The probability, for example, of them traveling a distant x before scattering is just e to the minus tau. And so to see how far they go, you can just sample a random number between 0 and 1 and then solve for x. And so the distance between the next scatter sampled randomly uh, is given by this. So that each individual particle does something completely random, but taken as a whole, the whole, uh, if you do many, many particles, uh, you kind of converge to the right average behavior. The limitation, of course, is if you're doing this random sampling, there's going to be some noise in your results. And so everything's going to have some statistical noise because you're just randomly sampling, and it's only in the limit that you use kind of an infinite number of packets that you really get the right um, solution. Um, and so that adds to the computational expense, the fact that you have to use a very large number of, of packets to do it. The, the, the advantage is, is that it's kind of intuitive, and you can include very complicated interactions here, just simulating uh, directly, for example, if they're scattering anisotropically or if they're um, doing some sort of inelastic scattering. It's kind of straightforward to include. So these packets interact with each other, or each one can So in the case, yeah, that's a good question. In the case of like photons and neutrinos, the self-interaction uh, is usually ignored, so they're really interacting with the gas. And so, for example, when he, this is, say, my grid, and each year I know the gas density and temperature, and I can calculate the opacities. Now, we heard that there, there are sort of self-interactions that neutrinos, for example, can, you know, they can annihilate with each other, or they can you know, cause collective oscillations. And so far, that really hasn't been incorporated into 
a Monte Carlo scheme, you would probably need even more packets to be able to, to measure the self-interaction. But that would be an interesting sort of direction to, yes, to explore. He did, did yeah. neutrino annihilation kind of? Yeah, but I don't know if he had uh, actual like self-interaction. So like, the, like annihilation the annihilation maybe assumed some background uh, kind of thermal neutrino field, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, there's a lot of promising things here. And one of the main advantages is that it, it parallelizes quite well. I mean, you just, if you have a big computer, you can put packets, you know, some packets on one processor, other packets on another processor, and you can just scale this thing out to very large um, uh, parallel machines. And so at the end of the day, when we have a huge machine, maybe we'll just do what nature does and, and follow follow individual particles around. Okay, so I have a few minutes left and I'll kind of just introduce, um, you know, how these ideas I said would be applied to, say, modeling supernova light curves and spectra. And, uh, and then I have a talk uh, tomorrow where I'm going to talk more about um, kind of results from simulations in the context of neutron star mergers and what we can see uh, from the light curves and spectra of those objects and what they tell us about the dynamics and, and nucleosynthesis. So this will just be a little bit of background of how we can connect uh, simulations of, of supernova and, and other explosive objects to uh, data. So for example, here's a 3D simulation done by Hammer and Yanka where they, here's a star, uh, it's color coded by composition. So here's mostly carbon, but as it explodes, you get all this complicated mixing and there's kind of blobs of blue stuff, which is radioactive nickel and oxygen and all these things. So this, this model produces a, a pretty interesting aspherical explosion with all this structure to it. And you'd like to ask whether this kind of nucleosynthesis is consistent with what we see when we see a supernova light curve in, in spectra. Like I said, on the time scale of this explosion, which may be seconds or something, um, the photons aren't doing much, right, that they're trapped. So during the explosion, you don't do transport, but once the, you've run your simulation, you can sort of post-process the, the hydrodynamic outputs and, and get, say, the photon spectra and light curves. So this is kind of just showing you the difference in dynamic range that you have when you're doing the explosion, which is happening here, maybe sort of down at neutron star radii and below, or slightly above where the densities are really high and the radius is small. But after you explode this star, this remnant starts to expand sort of freely. So the radius kind of grows like the velocity times time. And it'll expand from something that was maybe down at you know, stellar radius all the way out to something that's a remnant the size of the entire solar system. And in that expansion of this remnant material, uh, the density is going to drop you know, here by some almost 20 orders of magnitude to be a very low density cloud. And this is what we actually see when we observe that photon light curve in spectra. We're not seeing the explosion itself and all this high density material. We're seeing this very diffuse cloud of gas that's about the size of the solar system. It's cooled off uh, tremendously by expansion. So just doing work as it expanded, you know, maybe it was billions of degrees during the explosion in the central regions, but then it cools off to something closer to the surface, you know, temperature of the surface of the sun. So we, we're basically, when we see a supernova, we sometimes say we see a supernova explosion, we're actually seeing um, the aftermath of that explosion, this cloud of material that's quite large, quite diffuse, and, and maybe radioactive. And so you see a light curve like this, that's basically the photons and leaking out of that radioactive cloud. There may be heating here, so these explosions typically make radioactive nickel, which decays and keeps the ejecta hot and can power emission here. So the light curve we see is really the, the photons diffusing out of that cloud of debris. The duration of this light curve is related to how long it takes the photons to diffuse out. And so if you actually ask what is, you know, what's setting this, this light curve duration here, it's really related to the diffusion time of photons through this cloud. That's all really is, and I told you before, the diffusion time is basically an optical depth times uh, kind of a light crossing time, R over C. 
So you can write the optical depth as, uh, in this case, an opacity times a density times a radius. And kind of just doing a, a twiddle argument here, the density is kind of mass over radius cubed. So the diffusion time is basically a scales with the mass, the opacity, and inversely with the radius. But in this case, the remnant is, is expanding, so the radius actually is growing with time, like V times T. So we can plug that in for R and solve for T. And we get what's kind of one of the fundamental equations for a supernova light curves, which was, goes back to early work by Arnett, that kind of the duration of the light curve uh, scales with the mass of the material that got ejected and its opacity, uh, and inversely with its velocity. So just by measuring the duration of this light curve, we get some information as to how much mass was ejected and how massive the star was. And for the opacity, well, we have to do a detailed calculation to know what's all the ways in which photons can interact with the gas in this cloud. There's a lot of different things. So I mentioned electron scattering at the beginning is one of the key photon interactions with the plasma. There's also photoionization or bound free, which is very important at UV wavelengths. There's Bremsstrahlung or free free, which is a little less significant in the optical it's a function of wavelength. And then there's all these lines, bound bound transitions that can be, photons can interact with the different level structure of an atom and the photons can interact with those. So to do a, tra you know, to do a calculation really you would want to consider the actual detailed structure of the atoms in the gas. For example, here's the electron energy level structure of calcium 2 ion, you know, ground state and certain excited states, right? And you can have all these sort of radiative transitions between all these states. And those are all lines at which photons can be absorbed or emitted, right? So to calculate the transport of the photons through this cloud, you would want to have a model like this of the calcium atom. You have to know how many of the atoms are in each of these excited states. So in thermodynamic equilibrium, that's pretty straightforward. It's just given by some Boltzmann factor. But if it's out of equilibrium, you have to really look at the rates at which all these atoms can transition from one level to the other and solve a much more complicated problem. For calcium, it's not too bad. For iron, it's worse. It's a more complicated atom, so there's way more levels. Uh, and there's way more lines in between these. So there's going to be hundreds of thousands or millions of lines to deal with. And so computationally, it starts to become kind of a headache to deal with all these interactions that go on. But as you saw in this previous plot, all these lines, which are each one of these dots is representing one of those transitions, they all kind of smear together to form sort of a main opacity that dominates at a lot of wavelengths. So you have to include all that line physics. And we'll see it's also really crucial when we talk about neutron star mergers and what they look like. You have to keep in mind something I haven't talked about, that the material is expanding, so photons are getting Doppler shifted as they move through here, so their frequency is actually changing in the co-moving frame. So this transport equation, which looked kind of innocuous when written this way, if you write it including all these factors and special relativistic effects that uh, include the, the Doppler shifting, it looks a little bit more like that. Uh, so a little bit more painful to deal with. All these betas and gammas are, of course, relativistic corrections, which are not that important in supernova since the speed of, you know, the, speed of the eject is maybe a few percent of the speed of light. But, um, and here we see derivatives with respect to frequency representing how the photons are getting Doppler shifted relative to the co-moving frame. So things get a little bit more complicated. But if you solve all that, you can predict what the spectrum coming out of it would look like. So this is actually for a type 1a supernova model, but the idea is the same. You have some eject a structure that you got out of your hydro simulation. Here it has some nickel in the center and some silicon sulfur on the outside. And you basically transport your photons through this, including all those line transitions, and you get something that kind of looks black body-ish. It's sort of a thermal black body at 10,000 Kelvin. So not too hot again, this thing is expanded and cooled. And then you see these line features from different elements. And they're quite broad, and that's of course because of the high velocities of this uh, ejected material. They're all Doppler broadened, all these lines. So this is kind of one of the key ways we can diagnose the 
composition of this ejecta. We look for these line features uh, and try to match it. Um, things changing over time. So here's this calculation showing it evolved over time over the period at which we typically observe these supernova light curves, so a period of months or so. And over time, this cloud is expanding and uh, it's getting more and more transparent. And that's kind of what we're trying to show over here. Actually, the whole thing is expanding. And then this uh, opaque region is kind of showing you how deep into the ejecta you can see. So as time goes on, you start seeing deeper and deeper into this debris um, as, the, as the whole cloud becomes more and more transparent. And you can see the spectrum evolve uh, correspondingly. Initially here, you see this loose stuff, which is mostly silicon, sulfur, and calcium. Later times, this photosphere recedes into the region where there's iron and nickel and cobalt in the spectrum changes. So we can kind of diagnose over time, if we take spectra, we diagnose kind of the, the layered compositional structure. Uh, and that's uh, one of the key ways we can test our model. So here's a comparison of a model like that to actual data. Here are light curves in different wavelength bands that were observed, these points and the solid lines are a model. Um, and then here's spectra. Again, the red are observations and the black is a model, you know, taken every week or so uh, around the peak of the light curve. And so you can see we can now compare our model with the uh, observations. This model does a pretty decent job at fitting, you know, the light curves and most of the wiggles here. Um, you know, you can see some discrepancies. Uh, you know, for example, here there's sort of a sodium feature that doesn't seem to quite appear in the model. You know, maybe that's telling us something about the nucleosynthesis in our explosion. And in some cases, the, the line position doesn't quite match up. So that may be telling us something about how much Doppler shift is here. The model seems to be moving a little too fast because these lines are Doppler shifted. And so, you know, by this kind of comparison, we can test the energetics, the nucleosynthesis of the explosion and all the stuff we've been talking about can be connected directly to, to observations. So that's where I'll finish up. And, and then tomorrow I'm going to, you know, this was more of a methods sort of talk, but tomorrow I'll show you uh, more results of simulations of what's going on uh, in neutron star mergers where there's a lot of similarity in the physics. Uh, and at the end of the day, you may merge two neutron stars and, and eject material and get some sort of light curve that we can observe. And so all the stuff we talked about, we can apply to understanding the dynamics and nucleosynthesis uh, in neutron star mergers. So I'll stop there, take questions. Thanks. <laughs> questions? Yeah. Well, so the noise, it, you know, it's kind of a statistical noise. So the, uh, you know, the signal to noise is going to go like one over the square root of n, like your typical kind of thing. So if you're talking about, uh, you know, it depends on what you want. These, these light curves, say, for example, were calculated using a Monte Carlo transport method. Um, and so let's say we want 1%, per, you know, noise, no more than 1% noise in our results. Well, we'd have to calculate, uh, we'd have to have 10 to the 4 particles to get a uh, signal to noise of, of 100, right? Square root of 10 to the 4 would be 100. That would give us 1% accuracy. So you need 10 to the 4 particles in every sort of bin that you're interested in. So for every time step you'd need, and for every wavelength bin, you would want something like 10 to the 4 particles. Um, and then if there's something that's a 3D model that has different angle dependencies, you'd want many particles. So, you know, for a 1D model, if you want to do the time in spectral evolution, maybe you can get away with 10 to the 8 particles. In 3D and stuff, you might need, you know, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12, uh, depending on how much noise you can tolerate. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge. So you're going to have to, you know, if you, the ideal case is where you can basically just take your entire problem 
and fit it on a single node uh, and then move particles independently so that particles don't have to be uh, communicated, communicated um, from processor to processor. So that, that gives you a memory limitation. So you, you want to store, basically you have to store the opacities uh, as a function of 3D space and of frequency um, and pre-compute those and store those. And so that can be a huge memory load. Um, and uh, so if you're confined to small memory loads, you have to kind of break up your domain into different pieces and put it on different processors. And then there's a communication as, say, a photon would propagate out of one region into another region and have to be communicated to another processor. So, um, so you, yeah, it's going to be challenging if the, if the memory gets smaller and smaller, although um, there may be methods to sort of um, to help with that. I mean, some of the, the physics that so a lot of your time is spent doing sort of interaction physics of scattering and and relativistic transformation. So if you can sort of put that workload onto your flops, and then um, uh, you may do a little bit better. Yeah. I have a question about the variable edge in general sense model. Uh, you mentioned you don't have to solve it at each step. I'm just kind of curious too about fidelity, like you know, how you know, I know not solving every step is a luxury, and that you would be you know, tempted a little further. But right. is there any what's the relationship between the fidelity and how often you solve it? Uh, well, I imagine that's that's problem dependent about how you know how how much the radiation field is changing over a certain number of time steps. So the idea is you you know that's that's a parameter in your calculation. You can decide how often you want to recalculate um, the full transport thing to get the variable editing ten tensor. And so um, so you may have some criterion to say you know if the gas distribution has changed by some significant amount, I'd expect the radiation field to have changed, and I better recalculate it again. So uh, I don't know if there's one solution, or it's sort of something that has to be experimented with in, in different cases. Um. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I guess we can break for lunch then. Yeah, thanks, guys.